We've got an exciting half hour or so planned for you guys today as we plan to dive into understanding the truth only as told by Kapil Gupta about your industry. And I can hardly wait for your perspective, Kapil. But first off, how are you? Doing well. All right. It's always good to hear your voice, man, when we do these. But before we dive into our topic today, I want to address two quick questions that I have gotten from our audience that I think are really worthy of discussion. The first one is something that we've talked about in the past, but uh, I want to drill a little bit deeper in there, and it has to do with positive self-talk. And I know we've touched on this briefly before, but the idea of no mind that you share is still so elusive for so many um, so given the choice, this particular member wanted to know, isn't self-talk better than the alternative? Then what negative self-talk? Uh, but what, you know, just like last time, I mean, I'm not sure if the listener heard the last talk or not, but I think the question is largely, uh, it's a, it's a very, um, it's sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel of a question because it's kind of like comparing two irrelevant things and asking which one is less irrelevant. Uh, so I mean, p- positive self-talk or negative self-talk, or I mean, they're not that different. I mean, so positive self-talk, yeah, it might give you a little uptick in terms of how you feel. But uh, it, whenever you talk to yourself, uh, put it this way. When you try to convince somebody else of something, the other person feels as if he's been trying to be convinced. Is that right? And that's, that's my biggest pet peeve with sales. That's a whole nother topic of conversation, but yes. And, and so, and so if, when you talk to yourself, the fact that you have to talk to yourself, um, yourself, I mean, basically your mind, uh, immediately puts up red flags and says, Oh, I'm trying to be convinced. And therefore it, it puts up a brick wall, the same as anyone puts a brick wall up when someone tries to sell them, sell them something, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The salesman's talk. So self-talk is salesman's talk. It's not real. So the only things that are real are the things that you feel, and the things that are spontaneous and are done as soon as they're done. And then the message comes across loud and clear, whether it's another person or whether it's oneself, that, oh, this person is serious. It's done. So self-talk is very, I mean, these are very low level concepts. These are, these are very like 101 basic human juvenile kindergarten type things that I'm kind of shocked that people who have spent so many decades of their life trying to uh, ostensibly trying to learn about it and all they've come to is self-talk and when they haven't gotten over that little hurdle, it's kind of like you haven't got past your ABCs. So it's kind of it's kind of silly. I mean, there's a there's a there's a whole um, you know there's there's a whole universe of unexplored truths that no one's even knocking on the door. You know, everyone's still stuck on this little little you know one little step up to the garage door. That it's 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 juvenile. Well, it's what it's what modern society and and culture really programs everybody to do who who subscribes to the whole idea of self help. Yes, it is. Um, but it's, it's at what you said is absolutely true. Um, what I will say though, is that, um, whether the people who are programmed became programmed by modern society or whether they became, even if modern society didn't program them, something else would have. And the reason is, is because they are to a large degree programmable and so we are all in many ways conditioned, but it really takes a particular strand of DNA of a, of a human being to, to be programmable only to an extent before he naturally stops and says, and says wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? Um, so I absolutely blame it on society. There's no doubt about it. But then again, society is created by human beings. And so the human beings who create these so-called, the so-called programming are also the very ones who wish to be programmed. So, so whether it's the one, who, the one who is doing the programming or the one who is being programmed, the fact is 
that, that the number of people in this world who are neither of those groups is very small. So I can't, so I can't just blame it all upon just so-called this amorphous, impersonal thing called society. So let me ask you, well, you know what, I, I, let me, that brings up something that I have heard on more than one occasion from people who were super elite achievers in whatever field of endeavor they're in, that when they look at their performance, they think that the last 10 or 20% of their performance often comes from negative emotions, which is their ability to get in touch and almost tolerate their fears. Do you see that? What do you mean last 10 or 20%? Kind of like, you know, that last, it's almost kind of like the last, you know, 10% of, of charging a battery, whether it's with a car or a phone often takes the longest. So, you know, when you think about golf, for example, since you're involved when you're involved heavily in golf, you know, the step up from winning a PGA tournament and winning a major term tournament is that ability to get in touch with that negative a moment that can fuel a different level of ingenuity or performance. Um, you know, that, that could be true. I mean, what, basically what you're saying is, uh, that negativity can light a fire under someone is what you're saying. That there's some good to that. Absolutely. Um, negative mo- motivation is far more powerful than positive motivation. Uh, being the, the prospect of losing something is far more pow- powerful than the prospect of gaining something. Uh, so loss aversion is more powerful than than acquisition, so, so to speak. Uh, so that, that's that's true. That's true. Um, but it, it isn't it isn't necessarily a strategic thing to where someone says, well, I'm here. I better introduce some negative emotion or something negative so that I can climb on that negative step and gain that. And, you know, it has to happen organically. Right. So. Uh, so I. Yes. There is, there is absolute truth to that. Um, you know, a lot of the motivation that comes from people who achieve is that during their childhood they were they were ridiculed, mm-hmm. and that is a, that is an enormously powerful motivator. I love this question. It leads me to this question from an individual who who sent it in. And it's one that I've contemplated many times, but uh, the reference is obviously one of the themes of the work that you do is freedom. Yes. And the question is, this individual is asking, while, while I listen to the conversations that you have with Kapil, I leave knowing that freedom is what I most want in life. Yet the moment I start to think about it, fear sets in. So am I really... And I'm not really sure why. Could it be that I am afraid of freedom? I think that's a really good question. 100%. Um, Because everything is a cost. And if something sounds nice to you, and it may be something that you genuinely want. However, the question is not whether you genuinely want it. That isn't the question. the question. The question is, do you genuinely want it at the exclusion of all else? Mm-hmm. That, you're, that you're willing to pay whatever it takes without any idea or any notion that you should or that it's good for you or that it's proper or it's moral or it's correct or it's healthy or it's spiritual. None of that garbage. No. Do, do you, regardless of what the world says and with no rules or regulations whatsoever of m- false morality and all of this nonsense, do you actually want that more than anything else? Now, you, the the person is absolutely right. Freedom actually happens to be something that everybody wants. In fact, freedom happens to be the thing that everybody wants more than anything in their life. It is just that um, they pursue it by the, the, they they look for water within a rock. So uh, so because the idea is amorphous, and yet the things that they have in their life are tangible. Comparing something amorphous to something tangible becomes frightening, because you don't know really what it is. So. It really is less about freedom of, and it's more about freedom from. So the, the question more becomes um, along the lines of, uh, 
freedom from anxiety, freedom from fear, mm-hmm. freedom from pain, freedom from all of these things, then that becomes much more tangible. That becomes much more understandable as opposed to, you know, some magical idea of freedom. What, what does that really mean? So they know, everyone knows what anxiety is on an experiential level. Everyone knows what fear is. Everyone knows what failure is. Everyone knows what, what pain and confusion and sorrow and sadness all those things, everyone knows what that is. And because someone knows what that is, if you view freedom as freedom from those things, then it becomes much more tangible and understandable. You know, I once heard Bruce Springsteen say that um, to taste freedom, all you need to do is risk being yourself, your true self. And the more that you and I dig deeper into some of these issues, that is the minority of individuals in this world that are willing to take the risk of being themselves? I don't think there's any risk to anything. I don't think anyone should risk anything. I think it, I think something becomes possible for a human being when he has no choice. If there's a risk, then it isn't worth doing. Well, the risk of being yourself is also the risk of being unaccepted by other people, the risk of being, you know, ridiculed. And, and, you know, those are the things that I think cause individuals to have fear, although we're all in pursuit of this level of freedom, is very difficult for people to walk away from something like you said. Well, I would say that it's much more along the lines of freedom from the fear of losing a job. Freedom from the fear of of whatever the situation may be. I don't, I don't think that you can, I don't think it's practical to give something tangible away in exchange for an idea. It has to be tangible both ways because only then can you compare the, compare the value of each tangible thing. So, so, so what, I, what I disagree with what the idea of what Springsteen said, what I disagree with is, well, all you have to do is this. I and mean, whenever there's an all you have to do, no one's going to do it, mm-hmm. and, and nor, nor, nor should they. Because, because you know, do you know why? Because it's a leap of faith. And leaps of faith, they're not practical. They're all, they only exist in, in books. There's no, there's no leap of faith of anything. If you... If you have faith in anything, you're probably going to fall on your face, okay? Because most things aren't worth believing in. They're not true. So there can't be any leap of faith. There can be a leap. There can be a leap towards something that you don't know. There can. But in order for that leap to happen, the circumstance of your present-day environment has to be so bad and unacceptable that you are willing to take take a leap. And if someone says to you, well, what are you leaping towards? That person will say, I have no idea. All I know is that I am not going to be here anymore. Whatever this is, this is not going to happen anymore. I can't be, I don't know where I'm going to go, and I'm willing to leap. All I know is that wherever I land, it's not going to be here. So that's, that's desperation, right? It can never be of a sound mind and a conscious decision. Those things are... No, those are textbook type things. They're not real, right? Um, it has to be something that, that's there's there's a, there's a longing or a massive aversion, right? Everything is about the extremes. It is not about the moderation. Everything is about the extremes. It is only the extremes that produce transformation. So let's talk about industry and let's talk about the, th- the truth about industry. And I thought it might be good for us to set some context and maybe frame our conversations around the idea uh, that, that it's really about entrepreneurs who are building companies since that's primarily our audience. When do I truly know as an entrepreneur in whatever industry that I really do understand the truth about my industry? What does that look like? Oh, that's a, that's, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It matters that the question is asked. See, you, you, it's, like, um, it's like jumping into a river. When you jump into a river, um, the flow takes you. And when the flow takes you, you, you are moving so fast that you are trying to avoid the rocks that come in your way. You are 
You are worrying about the waterfall that may come at any time, right? You're worried about the branches that stick into the river from the, the bank so that you don't get cut. Um, so everyone is so lost because, it, because the, the flow is so powerful and so pervasive and so all-encompassing that everyone gets lost in the putting out of the fire, such as avoiding the rock, avoiding the branch, looking out for the waterfall, whatever it may be. Uh, and so there is so much to do. There is so much uh, going on that uh, the, uh, the assumption is already made that, that the, the questions that are already stated when the person comes into that industry – are the questions that he begins to ask. He never asks, wait a minute, are the questions that are being asked even relevant? That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. It's always, um, okay, so I'm going to jump in here. You guys are playing this game, so let me try to compete and play it too. How do I get better at this game? Mm -hmm. So immediately one begins to try to get better at the game that's already going on, as opposed to asking, wait a minute, why, I don't want to get better at this game. What, why is this game here, and who are the opponents, and why did they start? No one does that. No one does that. They, they, they jump into the river, and they get taken by the flow. So it has nothing to do – that, that's, a, that's a, a 40 year later question that you just asked. How do I know when, when, when I've arrived at what the truth about the industry is? That, that's, that's way down, you know, downstream. But the first thing is who, who's asking the question to say, wait a minute. Who's forget? I mean, even more fundamental than saying what games are you playing? Even more fundamental than that, and this is where almost nobody goes. Is is well, what industry am I really in? No one asks that, right? So there are questions that are so ridiculous that no one will even pose them out loud because they know that they'll get smacked down so quickly before they even arrive at the last word of their sentence uh, because. What do you mean? What industry you're in? I mean, what are you? What are you? You know, you don't you don't know anything. You don't even know what industry you're in. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me tell you right now, there may be three people who know what industry they're in. No one knows what industry they're in. They just know the industry. They just know the industry that has been created in that name. They don't know what actually it's about. They don't know what the fundament of the fundament is. And if they did. They would not join the games and in not join the games, they would ask fundamentally different questions, which would take them on different tangents and avoid all the mud wrestling. So tell me what state of mind does it take for me to at least start to recognize that I don't want to go down that river, that river? Well, there, there's no state of mind. It's, it's either that either that comes within you or it doesn't. Right. Or someone brings that to your if it doesn't come with you, then you someone brings that to your attention or they don't. So if it naturally comes within you, then um, you will be elite. Uh, if it doesn't come within you and no one brings that to your attention, then you're you're sunk. So you work with leaders who are outliers and innovators in their respective industries do you find their approach to thinking about their industry different than most of the other people out there? Generally, yes. Generally, yes. Um, a lot of times it's also that uh, they, I would say more, more succinctly, that uh, the DNA for that is there. The, the sensitivity and the receptivity of that is there. The seeds of that are there. And in most cases, those seeds have already been planted and blossomed. But a lot of times they've forgotten about those seeds because they've lived in this environment for so long in which the only loudspeaker voice they hear is that of society and of their own industry that you kind of by osmosis begin to fall for those traps because it's all you hear. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, brainwashing in in Gitmo, right? They hang you upside down. They put speakers in your own, whether they do it or not. But that's what you hear, right? And that I, you hear about prisoners of war, you know, getting, you know, put loud speakers in their in their ears, uh, saying the same things over and over again of, of, you know, that they want them to hear. It's the same thing, right? Everything's Gitmo, 
wherever you look, this is all terrorism. Wherever we go, it's it's all this is all one mass conditioning. Uh, there's no, there's no difference. Um, so so then they tend to forget who you know that they're not of this ilk. Um, uh, but but yes, I mean it it turns out. I mean I guess it's self selecting in a way because of who I choose. Uh, but the, the the people who I work with are they they have that seed either it's in some it's blossomed in some it's not um but that receptivity is always there and since most of them are leaders does that does that receptivity and does that level of thinking appeal translate to everybody else in the organization so are they shifting the entire ship in the direction that they want to go no i think it's more about them and um the the, the steering of the ship really has to be done by the top and not by top committees, by, but by top individuals. So I, I don't, I think it's a very impractical thing to say that, you know, that needs to be fed into all of the, um, uh, the entire company because that's very impractical. You're not, you're not going to feed this type of DNA into non DNA people. You're just not. Um, so, so you steer the ship according to what you think is, you know, in line with your uncompromising vision and everyone else sort of rides the ship. But this, but the, but this democratic, this, this need or effort to try to explain to others so that they will, they'll, you'll get blank looks. There's, there isn't enough time in a lifetime to do that. And even if there was, it still wouldn't do you any good. So let me ask you about one particular industry. Let's assume, let's assume you or somebody that you work with very closely is in at the real upper echelon of finance. And that's an industry that is as traditional and as conventional as you come. How do you approach thinking unconventionally about that business? Well, it, it's irrelevant what business it is. I mean, the questions are always the same. The question is, whatever the prevailing beliefs are, are they true? And what is the evidence that they are true and who, and, and have these questions really been asked or not? Well, most of the time they think they're true, right? And, and isn't it because they don't, they only, they're, they're providing surface answers to themselves and it's really all they know. Like if I go and talk to some of the people that I know in finance and ask them the same question, the likelihood that I'm going to get a similar answer is very high. Well, that's, but but why is that? Because that's, that's all they know. And it has succeeded for them. You know, it's served them well for whatever. I would say say it's probably 80% that that's all they know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the remaining 20% is because they don't have that DNA. And do you think you can acquire See, that DNA? I think, I, th- I think it is a massive, I think it is a, I, I think it's massively misleading and frankly incorrect to assume that the, the, the majority of people, right, who have been conditioned according to the prevailing dogma of their industry, that if they were if they were brought into a room and they were told the truth, that they would suddenly have all that this 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 amazing epiphany, and they would say thank you, and they would they would you know say I'm so glad I now know the truth. That just isn't going to happen. Now might there be one, or maybe two in the entire yes yes, but. But that so it, that's why I say it isn't just about the fact that that's it's all they know. It is the fact that even if they did know, it, it, it's they would have to have a certain uh, fortified foundation in order to in order to be able to carry that truth. And most just don't. I, I, they just don't. I'm not here. To make things sound nice, Mo, I mean, I, what am I going to say to you? They, they just don't. The number of people, I mean, look at Twitter. I mean, just look at the comments that I receive from people, right? Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at the comments, not just yeah. me, not just me, look at the comments everyone receives, right? I mean, most of them are very 
unintelligent comments. And most of them, most of the comments are that the, the tweet hasn't even, you can clearly tell that the person who responded didn't even fully read the tweet. That as soon as there was a word that triggered them, that they immediately stopped reading it and then responded because it went against their belief. Now, I don't think anyone should agree or disagree. Um, and I don't think that that's wrong what they did or right what they did. I'm simply making an observation uh, with no expectation of any change in behavior, right? I'm just making an observation that this is the way human being, the vast majority of human beings are. No, so the idea that you keep implying that if only they knew the truth, Mo, you don't even want to know the truth. Nobody wants to know the truth. It's just, it's just the case. It's it just it that's just the way things are, and and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that someone should be told that they should want to know the truth. It, it's just the way it is. The you know the 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 Pacific Ocean is blue, the sun rises in the east, and nobody wants to know the truth. And there's no wrong or right about that. There's no outrage. It just is the way it is. Mm-hmm. And how about the DNA? You know the 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 twenty percent that that you were talking about. Um, that have the DNA to be outliers in their industry. Yeah. Can the rest of the people out there who are not part of that 20% um, but, capture some you, of that magic? But, but my, why, why? Why do you ask this question? Like, why do you care? Why? Okay, here, you know, I, I'm not interested in asking if the masses can be raised to notches. Right, we're not talking about the masses. Maybe we talk about say twenty one percent instead of twenty. No, not, no, no, I said the twenty percent that remained in all the people who was were not going to get it. The twenty percent that remained as to why they did not get it. Not that twenty percent mm-hmm. of the population mm-hmm. is like right, right, right. Not, I'm with you. I'm with you. So, so what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not really interested in in raising the masses by two notches. I mean, why? It, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, it is a far more, far more promising and more productive and more transformational thing to raise the people who were at level eight, raise them to 10. OK, because them getting to 10 will automatically lift the others mm-hmm. just by them getting to 10. So it isn't about working at the bottom. I mean, this, the lowest common denominator philosophy is, is ridiculous. And that's what goes on in the schools and businesses. Everyone's the lowest common denominator. Why would you start there? Who cares? Let's work with the people who are at the top and make them 110%. So who do you, when you think about captains of industry, who do you think about? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think of captains of industry. I just, I, I, I'm not saying that there aren't amazing, rare DNA people out there because there are, I just haven't met all the captains of industry to, to be able to evaluate for myself. So what's often missing between the people who are at eight and what does it take for them to get to that 10 or even to a nine? Yeah. Um, good question. Uh, permission. You know, a lot of people highlight that in our talks or in our conversations as huge insights for them. Dive into that a little bit. What do you mean permission? Permission for what? Permission to get to that level? The people who are at eights and nines, Mo, um, tend to have an inkling that everything's full of crap. But um, something inside them says, but, but maybe, maybe it's not. And um, could things really be that off base? Uh, Maybe I'm overdoing it, right? When they're given the permission to say, you know what? All the doubts that you're having are 100% true. Immediately, the tether which keeps them tied to the earth snaps. And when that happens, do you think that level of authenticity or vulnerability allows them to access whatever is left to be able to elevate to that level? I think that, I think that if someone gives themselves the permission, absolutely. Um, but if I may be honest, 
I think many, I think for the most of the people who were at the eights and the nines, if they were going to give themselves permission, they would have already done it by now. And, and so, uh, you know, raising, you know, raising their voice against the background noise higher than the background noise is a very, you know, it's a very, um, uh, challenging and difficult concept uh, mm-hmm. or prospect. And so it tends to be someone else who gives them the permission. Um, and that's the way it oftentimes works. I mean, not always, not always. I mean, there are some who absolutely will give themselves permission, 100%. Uh, but then there are many others who, who you know, really, I mean, when you're – when you live in the ocean and all the waves say the same thing, right? And you're the only wave who is saying not only a little bit off, but like the moon, mm-hmm. compared to, mm-hmm. you know, then, you know, it, it, there tends to be naturally, there tends to be a need for permission to say, you know what? Yeah, actually it's true. Everyone is wrong. Every wave, what the, every wave in the ocean actually is absolutely way off base. You're the only one. And who, who is, who is that person that takes them to that level? Is it a coach? It can be, um, the number of a partner, who, the number of, the number of people who exist to be able to give them that permission is two and a half. <laughs> right. I mean, well, every, we've we're, gone we're from five to three small, to two and a half now. Well, right? well yeah, the five who exist, who need the permission, and there's probably two and a half who can actually give it, right? The world over. I mean, we're talking such small numbers. It, 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 the rarity of human beings with rare DNA is, um, is not, is, is way overstated. You know what I mean? It's, it isn't understood just how rare it is in this world. Mm-hmm. When you, when was the last time you gave somebody that permission? Oh, very, very, very often. And what do you see? What happens? There's something that typically happens that you see when that, when that light goes on. Yeah. There, 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 there there's a, a sense of absolute freedom when that happens because the person generally suspected it all along but all they kept hearing was the complete opposite, which is that they're crazy and they don't know what they're doing. Um, and they're, you know, and, and they knew it, they knew something was massively off. The DNA thing. Mm. And at that point, do you just start to see a change in behavior when you're working with them or what, what happens after you start to see that permission take hold? You know, I don't really know. I, I, I mean, I, I don't, do the conversations that you guys have change? Yeah, yeah, the questions change. Yes. Yes. Because the stakes get higher or what? No, because the the, the now all the stops can be pulled out because they were they were kind of put on layaway for so many years. Yeah, well this is a fascinating conversation because all of us, you know, with the exception of the two and a half and yourself, have <laughs> doubts. Right, have doubts about our capabilities, have doubts about our ability, and doubt sure. sets in. Sure, yes, yes. Right, and yes. we want to give ourselves that permission. Right, we want to be able to have someone else give us that permission, but for whatever damn reason, we don't. Is it? Be- well, what are you going to give yourself permission to do? Permission to to start to move towards that level of freedom that we're talking about. Well, I, the the permission that I'm talking about. Isn't the permission that I'm talking about is the 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 validation and the confirmation that the the suspicions that everything when everybody was wrong were true. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm talking about. That's the permission I'm talking about. So if someone doesn't already have that, then there's no permission needed. Then it's a prescription that you should move towards freedom or whatever it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that has to be, so someone needs, something already has to be there that needs permission so that it can leave the earth. It's permission to say, hey, you know, get away. It's almost that immunity from what other people think of me 
or what, you know, what my industry thinks of me that leads me to ultimately become, you know, unreasonably successful with, mm -hmm. within that context. Right. That's a huge thing. Yeah. Not caring what others think of you is a massive milestone. Yeah. That's a, that's a real difficult and you, and thing. You can't, and you can't prescribe your way there. Yeah. What did it take? When did you know you were there? Because I know you are. I think it comes down to what are the consequences of not being there and then, and then seeing if those consequences are acceptable to you or not without any sense of should or shouldn't. And so for me, it's not okay. Like for me, it's simply not okay. Um, that, that, uh, you know, what everyone thinks of me, you know, is, uh, something that I need to juggle and, uh, and, and change and manage and modify. Are you at a point in life where you're totally immune to, to the outside noise? I honestly, I haven't examined that question. I think it's a wonderful question. I haven't really, I haven't really asked that question if I, if I am or am I, am I not? Um, but I, but I will say that, uh, yeah, for me to give you an honest answer, I have to truly examine. But it's, I mean, it's a fairly good way there, you know. Yeah, you're definitely, you're, you're definitely there. Okay, my last question to you has to do with with the the scope of entrepreneurship that's going on in the world. It, you know, it seems like, you know, at least in the valley and in in other places in tech, that in order to create something really breakthrough, you have to do what no one else is doing. And, you know, people approach that by coming up with moonshots and so forth. If you were working with a group of entrepreneurs who wanted to start businesses with the thought process like that, how would you help them think? I would, I would, um, have them approach the matter from, the standpoint of what will give them ultimate satisfaction as opposed to what will give them pleasure. And what does ultimate satisfaction look like? Is that personal for each of us and or collectively as individual, as company builders? No, absolutely. It's it, well, it's for each person, each individual person, what satisfaction looks like for them. Um, I think it really comes down to getting away from chases and and with a uh, with with clarity and wisdom and calmness and serenity to examine why one is in the business that they're in, what business they actually are in that they didn't know that they were in, and um, to move away from anything that is done in a reactive fashion that will uh, only lead to a chase, uh, such as being better than another person, right? So none of these things have to do with being – are wrong or right. It's, it's not wrong to want to be better than anybody. Nothing is wrong. There are no rules. There's no morality. There's nothing, okay? There's just nothing. So what, what is truth is when I arrive at this place – which place do I have to arrive that will no longer cause me to chase? And, and that isn't wrong either. It is just that if you no longer have to chase, then you don't spin your wheels. Then you're not constantly thirsty and hungry. Which also means you don't really give a damn about your competition, right? That I know in your eyes they don't exist. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you, if you compete – um, then you haven't really found anything that's worthy because you, you haven't arrived at something that is, um, truly, uh, otherworldly. You're just one more of the same, perhaps a little bit better, or a little bit cheaper. So and that's, that, and that once again, once again, it, it's personal, uh, Mo, like, like, so to me, that's boring, right? To play the, to play the, um, did I lose by an inch or win by an inch game? To me, that's boring. 
Yeah. Now, I'm, no one needs to take my view. That's for me, right? So I would never tell someone else, you know, why would you do that? That's boring because it may not be for them. It may not be boring for them. Mm. I, still, I still think it's leaving a massive amount on the table. That, that's true. But one must approach things according to the way that he feels and what moves him and what inspires him. Does that go the same thing for athletes or golfers? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, athletes, athletes don't really – the athletes are just like the, the executives and the CEO. They're all the same. They're all the same. No one really asks where it is that they want to go. They want to win tournaments and championships. Well, that's – Right? Don't we? No, that's too vague. That's too vague. You have to find out what the ultimate destination is, and it may be that winning tournaments is a part of the avenue which takes you to that destination. But just winning a tournament or not, that's boring. That means that you're rolling the dice every single week. What's the ultimate, what's the ultimate vision? To be the best in the world? Is that's, that what, okay, is that what we're talking about? Sure. It would be the best in the world. That's, that's, that's more tangible, right? Um, you know, that it something, something, the destination has to be clearly spelled out. You know, I was, I was talking to, you know, I was talking to a tour caddy, you know, um, at a, at a, at a pretty big PGA tour event. And I said, you know, we were, it was, it was a rain delay and we were sitting there talking and I said, listen, um, you know, cause he was having trouble with his player. And he just said, listen, you need to go ask him, who do you want to be? And he looked at me and he said, Doc, listen, <laughs> if I asked that question to my player, he'd fire me. Yeah. Okay. And he said, if you ask anyone in this room, any of the tour players in this room, uh, that question, first of all, they wouldn't know how to answer it. They've never asked that question. No one's ever told them to ask that question. And they probably fire you for asking it. Right. Um, I can't ask my guy that question. You see? So this is, so no one, you know, the number of people who are truly exceptional, even on the PGA Tour or the NBA or in Silicon Valley or, you know, wherever you are, is, is, is minute, Mo, minute. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. So let me ask you, if for, for the three that are serious, how do we start to contemplate that question? How do we start to really explore this whole idea of what do we want so you're convincing me that most of us think we know what we want but we really don't people don't know what they want because they never really ask the question and the reason that they never really ask the question is because they're too busy chasing so i'm trying to think about that chasing so goals so, chasing so what whatever whatever chasing whatever the flow of the stream is i mean in order to ask a question you need to have space you need to have time away and a mental um, uh, sort of time out from the flow of the river, mm -hmm. so that you can so that you can actually ask that question. No one really, uh, no one really has that time or gives themselves that time because they're too busy. You know, the next meeting, the next email, the next phone call, the next you know, business lunch, the next, you know, lanyard wearing conference, right? The next, the, 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 ne the next, you know, employee to hire. You know, there, there's a line of 796 fires that need to be put out, right? There's no time and space to free of those fires to be able to ask that question. And even if there were, then that time and space would be used for vacation. So all the time in a person's life is spoken for. It's allotted. Hmm. Fascinating stuff, man. I guess we can hit pause on this session.